Hi, my name is Daniel Carvalho, and this is my presentation for Dr. Andy Lau's statistical mechanics class at Florida Atlantic University. And it covers the Luttinger liquid and Landau Fermi liquid theory. So what is the Luttinger liquid? Simply put, the Luttinger liquid theory is a modeling of how fermions would interact in one dimensional conductors. And using electrons as the fermion in question, we can already imagine what it would be like in one dimension. They would not be able to get out of each other's way, causing a perturbation of the whole line of electrons that is very different than if there was more than one dimension. This can be understood through the analogy of a traffic jam or a long line of people. The fermions are trapped in one dimension by the interactions between them with no other dimension to move through and avoid each other. Here I have outlined some of the things I'm going to cover in this presentation. And these include things like what electrons or fermions are, where we can find them, how to describe their movements and interactions in 3D or 1D, and why any of this matters at all. First of all, electrons are considered to be fermions. And fermions are one of the groupings of the elementary particles along with their counterpart bosons. Fermions are actually described by having a spin of one half and follow the Pauli exclusion principle that states that there cannot be two of the same spin particles in the same place. There can only be opposite pairs of the spin of plus or minus one half. And this is actually the same rule that determines the arrangement of the electrons in an atom. So an example of some fermions that one would know would be electrons, protons, and neutrons, which are the fundamental particles that atoms consist of. And on the other hand, bosons have an integer spin of one, two, or three, as opposed to the fermions half spin. And so they actually don't follow the Pauli exclusion principle as well meaning that they can occupy the same state at the same time. An example of a familiar boson would be a photon, or the lesser known gluon, which is actually responsible for the electromagnetic force between charged particles. So obviously electrons can be found in the atom, which composes everything there is around us. And the way electrons are stacked are according to the Pauli principle, which is dependent upon their spin, the individual spin. And it states only opposite pairs can be grouped together in the same orbital. But when it comes to conductors, the story is a little different. Not that the Pauli exclusion principle isn't followed, but in the way that you find the electrons. In conductors, we have what is considered to be loose electrons that are free to move about the valence shells of all the conductor's atoms. And this gives rise to electrons moving about each other, dependent on the interactions and the temperature of the conductor. And so using the conductor as the electron playground, we can describe the movements about the conducting atom, which will eventually lead to the one dimensional case of Luttinger liquid in a conductor. So this description can be given by the Fermi liquid theory, which is first derived from the Fermi gas theory after accounting for the interactions between the fermions and after adding spin as well. So the Fermi gas theory states that at a temperature of zero Kelvin or absolute zero, the Fermi energy of the non-interacting electrons or fermions in the topmost valence energy shell can be described by its mass and the concentration of the electrons, N over V. And this can be seen by integrating the density of states function, which this function just tells us the number of states possible per volume and per energy. And that's shown here. And you integrate this function from the ground state, which is taken to be at an energy of zero, to the topmost energy state, 
called the Fermi energy. And that derivation is shown here. So this Fermi energy is actually given by the equation h squared over 2m times 3n over 8 pi times the volume to the power of 2 thirds, where h is Planck's constant, m is the mass of the electron, n is the number of particles, and v is the volume. And as we expect, the energy of the topmost fermion, which is what the Fermi energy gives, is dependent on the number of fermions in the system and the mass of the fermion m, which in this case is the mass of the electron. And so this energy corresponds again to the topmost energy level filled when the temperature is at absolute zero without accounting for interactions or spin. Now, this energy can be used to understand the Fermi-Dirac distribution equation that describes the probability of finding a fermion, or in this case, an electron, at an energy E with respect to the Fermi energy we just calculated, which again is just the topmost energy filled when the temperature is equal to zero. The distribution is described by the equation shown here, F of E, which is dependent on the electron's energy in question, the Fermi energy, which we just calculated, and the temperature T in the factor beta. At T equals zero Kelvin, or absolute zero, this distribution becomes a step function, which is described by this. With respect to the energy, such that at an energy above the Fermi energy, the distribution goes to zero, and at an energy below the Fermi energy, the distribution goes to one, as shown by the yellow square. So this states that the probability of finding an electron above the Fermi energy is zero, and the probability of finding an electron at an energy below the Fermi energy is 100% at the absolute zero temperature. But when the temperature is not absolute zero, the probability of finding the electron below the Fermi energy becomes less than one, and the probability of finding the electron above the Fermi energy becomes more than zero. In other words, the increasing temperature has a probability of exciting the electron above the Fermi energy level. The energy occupation of the states around the Fermi energy can then be described by a widening of the step probability by a factor of Kb times t. This all can be seen in the graph where the yellow is the step function we just described and the curve is the broadening of that step function by an increase in temperature. This can more clearly be seen through experiment where as the temperature approaches zero and is lowered, we see that we are beginning to regain the step function that was in the yellow square previously. In this graph, you can see that the lower temperature 20 Kelvin is approaching that step function and the higher temperature 235 Kelvin is broadening the curve, making it more probable to find the electron above the Fermi energy. So up until now, we have actually just been discussing the simplified case or situation when there is no interaction among the electrons. Now, the dependence has been mostly on temperature of the conductor we are studying. But what happens when you add interactions? Well, then you get the Fermi liquid theory. So the addition of the interaction actually creates a very difficult problem. This is one of the many problems being worked on today, and it's appropriately named the many body theory. And that's because there are many electrons in our problem interacting with each other, which complicates the situation. But luckily enough, we have a scientist named Lev Landau who introduced the idea of quasi-particles, which are almost particles. And they're used to simplify the number of particles that are being accounted for in the theory. And so this gives the particles an effective mass, but in reality, the electron has the regular electron mass and it's moving in a complex fashion still interacting with all the other electrons along the way and making those react accordingly like a domino effect 
of vibrations or reactions by the close electrons. Now, Landau thought if theoretically you turned on the interactions slowly between the particles, slowly enough that it would be considered adiabatic, where no heat entered or left the system, you may be able to closely relate the interacting system with the non-interacting system, or in this case, the Fermi liquid theory to the Fermi gas theory. And so this can all be described by this equation shown here, where we have an effective mass, a quasi-particle interaction and quasi-particle distribution. And this is enough math to actually make your head want to spin. And this is all before even adding the spin component of the equation, which can then be shown here. And it may seem like a bunch of hoopla to be talking about quasi-particle interaction, interactions at this point. So we should just try to simplify, like Landau did. So if we look at the experiments of fermions and electrons at varying temperatures and different energies, with interactions turned on, we can see that the dependence of the temperature is actually a greater factor in what we can now call the Landau-Fermi liquid theory than the interaction of the electrons or fermions. And this can be understood by the fact that the particles have a lot more room to escape each other's interaction in two or three dimensions than in one dimension. And this can be sort of understood through the analogy of a three-dimensional world being in quarantine gives us the ability to escape interaction with one another. So in the experiment shown here with Molly Denham atoms, one can see that the broadening of the step function or the distribution function is not linked to the interaction, but actually temperature. In the upper graph of the intensity or spectral density, which is just another measure of the probability of finding an electron of that energy, we can see that at one constant temperature of 70 degrees Kelvin, the probability of finding a particle at the Fermi energy has the highest peak. In the middle graph, one can see that as the temperature is becoming lower and lower, the probability is becoming a higher peak with smaller width. This shows that it is approaching the step function from earlier at absolute zero temperature of the Fermi gas theory. Simply put, the lower the temperature, the more likely you are to find a particle at or around the Fermi energy. And this is with interactions turned on, which tells us the temperature plays a much bigger role in turning the Fermi liquid theory into the Fermi gas theory than the interactions. In three or two dimensions, particles can move around one another, like we said creating what Landau termed as quasi-particles and quasi-holes in the electron liquid. But going to one dimension, the movement of the electrons become a lot more restricted and interactions begin to take a much bigger role. The movement is no longer individual, but a movement of collective line of particles. This is where the idea of the traffic jam or long lines come in. There's no avoiding the particles in front of you, or the particles behind you, and you move as a collective group of particles interacting with one another continuously. And so now we finally approach the Luttinger liquid. The two main differences of limiting the particles to one dimension are the collectivization of the particles to move together as a group instead of as individuals, and the other important factor, which is the separation of the spin and the charge of the electrons. The charge of the electrons gives them interaction capabilities that create the movement in one dimension. This is because the momentum of one particle must be transferred to all the others in the system as well. When one moves, the others move too, sort of like a domino effect. And the second important factor is when there is an excitation in the one dimensional liquid of fermions or electrons, there comes a very special phenomenon that fractionalizes the excitation and it can separate the electrons into a part of just having spin and no charge called spin-ons and another part just having charge and no spin called holons. This is typically an impossible feat 
in higher dimensional theories, and is one of the unique qualities of the Luttinger theory. So now that we understand the interesting phenomena of the Luttinger liquid theory that isn't in the higher dimensional Landau Fermi liquid theory, why does any of this matter and how can we use it? Well, when Landau Fermi liquid theory was first understood, we began to be able to understand conductors on the microscopic level and began to theorize about superconductivity or information transfer with spin among many other crazy ideas. Now, beginning to understand a more fundamental part of how fermions or electrons behave in one dimension with this Luttinger theory, we can build up to bigger and better ideas too. Some of these ideas that are being thought up and experimented are one-dimensional quantum transport through quantum wires, organic one-dimensional conducting molecules, coupled one-dimensional chains to create and understand and control higher dimensional interactions or phenomena, higher temperature superconducting films using carbon nanotubes, and studying one dimensional quantum spin Hall effects, which can lead to more efficient superconductivity or quantum computing applications. And also studying trapped cold atoms. So after studying all of these theories, we can say a few things. One is that in three or two dimensions, electron-electron interactions can actually be avoided, and the dependence on the temperature can be seen as the main factor contributing to how we understand conductors or Fermi liquid theory. Secondly, we can see that just like you hate being in a traffic jam, electrons or fermions hate being in one dimension with each other and are actually willing to split themselves into charge and spin quasi-particles to accommodate excitations in the group. And this is a very special phenomena that can be taken advantage of, which leads to the third point, that the using, using this simple one-dimensional model, we can further our fundamental understanding of fermionic interactions and begin, just like with the Fermi liquid theory, to think up a multitude of future applications and improvements. And even today, as I gave you examples on the previous slide, we're only beginning to experiment and understand what we can do with the Luttinger liquid model in one dimension and build up to higher dimensions with. And here we can see the work cited, which include textbooks, lecture notes, and published papers. It is definitely not an exhaustive list by any means though. Thank you for joining me on this one-dimensional journey through Luttinger liquid theory. Have a good day.